Harrison Bush received her BA and MA PhD from the University of Akron in Akron, Ohio. She earned her doctorate in cognitive aging psychology with a particular emphasis on the cognitive neuroscience and neurophysiology of normative aging and amnestic mild cognitive impairment in early stage Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Bush is a research assistant professor at the University of South Florida, where she began her professional academic career in 2006. She serves as a faculty co-investigator in the neurophysiology of aging and the cognitive aging laboratories. Dr. Bush's research interests center on optimal aging, brain health, and early stage cognitive impairment. Driven by her love of people and commitment to using her program of research to positively impact the lives of older adults, Dr. Bush has partnered with Reliance Medical Centers as the Vice President of Science and Translation and the Director of Brain Health and Cognition. In these roles, she is responsible for translating innovative science into practice in primary care, thereby bridging the gap between research findings and application, and deliberately and purposefully integrating brain health and cognition into all facets of evaluation and wellness in the primary care setting. Through this unique partnership, older adults in primary care are guaranteed the direct delivery of innovative and evidence-based diagnostics, preventatives, and therapeutics in an effort to promote optimal aging and wellness. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Erin Bush. Thank you so much for having me back. Um, it's been exactly six months, I think. I'm a pacer, and so I am I able to. <laughs> well, and if I knew these meetings were this fun, I would come back. Old McDonald, I mean, this every week. <laughs> So again, very seriously, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to come back and speak. I know Lori and I, I believe, I think it was a year ago, actually, when we started talking about coming um, here and, and um, uh, past president Ruth Ben was kind enough to invite us uh, here uh, prior. So that's why I was here in June to talk a little bit about the research we are doing and have brought here to Lakeland, which is definitely a passion of mine, bringing uh, research opportunities, Alzheimer's prevention research opportunities here to our communities. Um, but before I get into uh, our talk today, I would like to introduce Melissa Tamabangsa. She um, has been instrumental and a champion for our optimal aging and brain health um, partnership with USF and Reliance Medical Centers. Um, she's with USF Foundation and Carol Peranto. Uh, she is a, um, one of our USF clinical research associates and she's also the coordinator of the brain care screening program at Reliance Medical Center. So I'm thrilled to have them both here with me. Um, so when I was here six months ago, I briefly offered some recent statistics, and I think it's very important to preface this, um, this brief talk uh, with those statistics. So every 65 seconds, there is a new case of Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. Every 65 seconds. One in 10, right now, one in 10 adults age 65 and older already has been di diagnosed with al Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in Florida and nationwide. It's a very real issue. Um, the cost of care, anyone want to take a stab? Cost of care for individuals with Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. $290 billion in 2018. 290 billion. This figure is projected to reach 1.1 trillion dollars by 2050. And quite honestly, I believe that's an underestimate. I, I really truly do. Are those statistics startling to you? Yeah. I mean, um, so it's a very, very real issue, one that I'm very passionate about, and I know many of you. Um, when I was here last also, um, 
I, uh, I believe uh, past President Ruthven asked how many of you have been touched by Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. And if I'm not mistaken, it was over half of the room. Um, so these issues are very real. Um, we are all being touched. Dementia doesn't touch just the person who's been diagnosed. Those ripple effects are far reaching. It's the diagnosed individual. It's the family, it's the friends, and it's our community. Um, so we are all affected. And statistically speaking, if you're not affected now, you will be. Um, so it, again, it should be at the forefront. So I'm so thankful for this opportunity because when Lori did ask me to come and speak, I said, oh, well, what would you, what would you like to hear? What do you think would be of most benefit to you, your members? And she said, I think we really need to go back to the basics. And I know I'm guilty of this myself. I get in my mode, I'm using my vernacular, and it's really at the expense of the individual with whom I'm speaking, because I am making inaccurate assumptions. And I, I think that if we have more of these opportunities to say, okay, there's so much information out there, let's go back and make sure that the foundation on which we're um, setting our knowledge and interpretation is accurate. And that will just make us better consumers of our medical information. It'll make us better advocates. We, let's increase awareness in any way that we can because this is an epidemic. It's not going to be an epidemic. It is right now. And what can we do? Um, so I can tell you that my colleagues and I are in relentless pursuit of a world without Alzheimer's. But we are also wanting to see what can we do for people who are living with it now and how can we prevent it. So um, we'll begin. So um, I, I did, I, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. Thank you for suggesting going to the basics because like I said, it's one of those things where I think a lot of assumptions are made about understanding it. It ends up confusing a situation that is already chaotic, a, a situation where it's already a crisis situation. When it's how well do you receive or understand information if you're in a crisis? I mean, dementia is the most feared condition that older adults face. Imagine receiving that diagnosis, and what now? It's gobbledygook coming in. Um, so let's get to become educated before we actually need that education. So that is my hope today, and I know for a lot of you this will be a review, um, but what I've done, uh, there are handouts, and I know it's very, very small, but it's just basically a reminder that if you would like um, a, uh, for me to email you a copy of the presentation, I'm happy to do that. So there's a lot of links that you can click on that might be informative. We just don't have a lot of time today. So actually, I'll go back to the slide. Misunderstanding dementia. It's because I think that um, at least I make a lot of assumptions about the understanding. And, and when you're throwing vernacular back and forth, sometimes, like I said, we just need to go back to the basics. So I, I as I was forming uh, this talk, I, I thought, what are, what are the, common, or the most common questions I receive? And without a doubt, even 20 years later, it is, is there a difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia, or are they the same thing? I still receive that 20 years um, down the road. So we'll talk about that first. So I'm a very visual person. I like visual representations. So dementia itself is not a disease. Oh, I will digress for one second. I believe that this presentation will be far more effective if it's interactive. So if you have questions about something in which I have not been clear, please, it's likely that other people have that same question. So please just jump right in, raise your hand. Um, and I think that that'll be beneficial for everybody. Um, so first, dementia is not a disease in and of itself. I have what's called the dementia umbrella. And so, there's a, I'm not sure what that is on the side there. I apologize about that. Uh, but you have dementia at the top, and then you have these uh, symptoms. So these are cognitive symptoms. So difficulties with memory, memory impairment, language difficulty, orientation deficit, um, personality shifts. All of these things are symptoms. That's the symptom profile. Dementia is a recognizable pattern of symptoms that tend to hang together and progress in a relatively predictable period over time. Okay, so that top part of the umbrella is dementia. Now, those, this pattern of symptoms is caused by something, right? So those things that cause this dementia symptom, or syndrome would be diseases, conditions, infections. So we're looking at two different things. Yes, ma'am. I have a question uh, about cancer. You talked about chemo brain, and I was told that 
you can walk through dementia when you're getting chemo, is that correct? That is correct, yes. Um, that is a, a, a um, it's, it's, if I'm, I'm kind of, I want to be clear. There are two different camps, and I'm trying to think about how to, how to say this diplomatically. There are two different camps. There are some people who very much believe that chemo brain, um, or chemo-related cognitive dysfunction, whatever you call it, is a very real thing. I have actually witnessed it. Um, so, but then there are others who say that it's not as serious a thing. But, um, but people identify, people do tend to agree that it does exist. Yes, ma'am. Would you mind repeating the question? Oh, oh, absolutely. So um, I apologize. The question was, do you, I believe that there is such a thing as chemo brain? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And can it have the symptoms? So basically, um, the effects of chemotherapy result in cognitive symptoms. All right. So, and we'll get into that just a little bit um, here in a moment. So, dementia describes the symptom profile, but it doesn't describe the cause for those symptoms. Okay, so what are some of the diseases and conditions and infections? Um, so, if you look, Alzheimer's disease is listed under, it is the most common cause of degenerative dementia. I'll tell you what that means uh, here in a minute if you don't already know. Um, and Alzheimer's disease is one of the many causes of the dementia symptom profile. Does that make sense so far? So when I say I have dementia, um, it would be analogous to saying I have a headache or I have a cold. It doesn't tell me, it tells me your symptoms, it doesn't tell me what the cause of those symptoms is. It doesn't give me an indicator of the treatment path or the etiology. Okay, so you can see a lot here. So for the conditions, vitamin deficiency, polypharmacy. Did you know that individuals 45 years old to 50 are taking on average of five medications a day? That's 45 to 50. 65 to 69 is at 18. 18, I have a hard enough time remembering to take my multivitamin and I can't imagine. I mean, think of just the propensity for error when you are managing and particularly if you're an older adult with mild cognitive impairment managing that, it's certainly going to make your, your um, situation quite a bit worse. Um, so that's, we'll get to that here in a little bit. Um, urinary tract infections can mimic dementia. Okay, we talked about chemo brain, so being treated. Going under anesthesia and coming out, so we'll differentiate between reversible and irreversible causes of dementia in a minute. But so do you see the difference? So the, the symptom profile is dementia, it tells you about the symptom, it doesn't tell you, tell you about the cause, the reason, and the potential treatment target. Am I speaking too quickly? I tend to do that. Okay. I'm trying to cover, I'll, I'll breathe then. How's that? I'm trying to cover a lot in a little bit of time. Um, so there are anywhere from 50 to 100 different causes of dementia. So if you have been in a situation where you're frustrated um, by the diagnostic process, it's because this is really complicated. Um, those 50 to 100 causes of dementia, that dementia symptom profile, um, there are two different classifications we use. One is reversible and the other is irreversible. Some of the reversible conditions would be the chemo brain. Okay, easily or readily treatable over time. Um, so if your infections, your polypharmacy, vitamin deficiencies, or actually, I have even heard of individuals who have experienced the pseudo-dementia in this reversible condition because they're taking too many vitamin supplements. Yes. <laughs> so beware. Um, just be good consumers, you know, do your um, do, do the background work. Um, but too many. Um, and depression can mimic dementia, but these are typically reversible um, conditions. Irreversible, these are the ones that you probably associate most with dementia, Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal lobe, dementia, vascular dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, um, those types of things. Some, some newly, well, all right, if anyone wants to talk about limbic predominant age-related TD, <laughs> 43 encephalopathy later. That's relatively new. Uh, we'll just call it late. I love the acronyms. Um, they make it easy for me because I can't articulate well. Uh, but late in part, I'd be happy to talk to you later. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, 
Okay. Oh, um, that's an excellent question. Have, have you heard of amyloid before? Amyloid? No? So that's a no. I've won no. Amyloid tau Lewy bodies are, I'll give you the technical and then I'll give you the non-technical. Lewy bodies are aggregates of alpha-synuclein, which is a protein that for some reason clumps up or misfolds and then forms debris in the brain that the brain can't clear. Okay, so it's trash. Um, there are different types of protein aggregates that are associated with the different causes of dementia um, that are irreversible. And so, yes, sir, I'll get to you in just one second. So the question was, what's a Lewy body? If I forgot to um, repeat that. In Alzheimer's disease, there's a presence, an overabundance, um, and an abnormal accumulation of amyloid and tau. They're two proteins. So um, when those proteins misfold, when they become clumpy, they stick, it kills neurons in the surrounding regions. Okay, but it's very interesting because many of these are linked, many of these irreversible causes of dementia are linked to um, proteins gone awry, if you want, uh, proteins gone wild. And the brain, as we get older, for um, many reasons, it, the inability to clear out the trash. So imagine, this is an example I use. You have a bag of trash and you have a well manicured lawn, it's beautiful, it's lush, it's green, it's wonderful, and you leave that trash bag filled um, with trash on your lawn in the middle for a month. What, ha what do you see when you pick up the trash bag? And that's pretty much what happens. And then that would be like, oh, you just put the trash bag down and you walk away and then you bring another trash bag out and another and another. So that's, is that helpful? Okay, great. <laughs> I'll use that one again. Um, <laughs> so, um, these are the different, <laughs> the different causes, some reversible, some irreversible. And we are going to go back to this. Hopefully we'll have time. One of the things about the irreversible causes of dementia, um, they're not readily treatable, they're incurable, that is why they're irreversible. Um, and they tend to follow one of two different patterns. One is called slow and steady, so it's a linear decline over time that someone is losing mental, physical, social, um, uh, emotional uh, well-being and functioning, um, but that, or stepwise. So there's a decline and then stability, decline, stability. Those are the two um, types of pro um, progression there. I'm sorry, sir, and I don't forget your, I, I looked at you and I said, oh, you had a question. I apologize, I skipped over you. No, it wasn't a question. I was oh. just gonna, I was actually gonna say that trash chamber, we always use the example of like plaque on your teeth, there's mm -hmm. plaque that goes in your brain, and it causes mm -hmm. a lot of electrons that cause that degradation. Well, and, and that cell death. I mean, the cell with tau, for example, we have a neuron and it's a it has a beautiful structure. It looks like, some, many of them look like cords. So you have the rubber around the wires that protects it. Tau is a protein that's responsible for keeping that cord from deteriorating. When tau is, when there's a chemical process that occurs with tau, that cord breaks down and you have exposed wires and the cell, there's no way to, there's no reprieve from that, there's no going back from that, that cell is, um, has deteriorated causing the clumps, causing the trash, um, and then the ineffective removal of that waste in the brain. Okay, so here it gets very complicated. So you can have an irreversible cause of dementia and also have a reversible cause of dementia. You can have two different types of reversible dementias. You can have two different types or more of irreversible dementias. So there are all of these configurations that makes diagnosis really, really difficult because we're trying to identify what, what's the cause? What's the cause? Is it something that can be treated? Um, or is it something that is going to be managed? Is it something that can be totally reversed? But the profile is very, what we see in the real world and what I would imagine you all have experienced in your personal life is people tend to present differently. Um, so it's very idiosyncratic. How many of you knew that sleep could affect cognition and can mimic dementia? 
Okay, so that's more than I thought. So excellent, sleep apnea, untreated apnea is a big one. You're ceasing respiratory function 100 times an evening. Um, you know, so, so be mindful. Insomnia also, that increases cortisol levels. Cortisol, in effect, kills brain cells. So there are many things we can do. So that'd be a reversible condition. Another question I often receive, were there any questions about what we covered with um, the difference between reversible and irreversible causes of dementia, what the difference is between dementia and Alzheimer's? Do you feel confident now? I don't know, for those of you who were not so confident before. Okay, so the, the second question what is very basic. What, what's the difference between early onset dementia and early stage dementia? These terms are interchanged, um, and, and I don't think purposely, uh, but they're interchanged very frequently. So when we talk about early onset dementia, we're talking about the age at which the disease process is thought to have started. Okay, so if that is age 65 or younger, uh, we tend to categorize that as early onset uh, dementia, early onset uh, Alzheimer's disease. There's a strong um, hereditary component to the early onset Alzheimer's and uh, dementias, frontotemporal dementias, if anyone knows someone with a frontotemporal dementia, um, those tend to have their onset earlier compared to um, Alzheimer's disease, for example, or sporadic later onset Alzheimer's disease, there's generally a more rapid decline. So for those of you who may have experience with a loved one who uh, is younger and has younger onset, um, the de decline tends to be more rapid compared to someone who has sporadic or onset after the age of 65. And then what, is, what does early stage mean then? And really this is just a progression of symptoms. So it's the, the presence of the symptoms, the type of the symptoms, and the severity of the symptoms along a continuum. Okay, so there, the, the most basic is just the mild, moderate, severe. Does that sound familiar to most of you who've had experience the mild, moderate, severe? There are some uh, very intricate, <laughs> um, staging systems we'll look at a few here, but on uh, the right-hand side, you can see at the top, there is what we consider a healthy or average brain, and you can see the brain of an individual with mild and then severe uh, degenerative Alzheimer's disease. So um, there are many things that you can look at here that are telling, you can see, because do you see how plump the brain looks at the top? Um, and then it seems to shrink. That's called atrophy, and that happens um, in the medial temporal lobes. First, they start to shrink. That's because of the cell death. Those are the cells dying. And then in the frontal lobes, you can see the chasms widen in between the little grooves, um, the peaks and valleys there, and that's why you may see over time personality shifts with your loved one. Um, see uh, the, the inability to pay attention, um, the memory loss being the medial temporal lobe. So um, I wish I, I'm not sure if this has a pointer, I'm not going to try. But um, you can see toward the bottom left-hand corner of the brain there, you can see big spaces or caverns there um, where the medial temporal lobes once were. And the reason I'm emphasizing that is because, have, did you experience memory loss with your loved ones? Do you have experience? The hippocampus, which is the master memory coordinator, we need that structure to form new memories. That's where it should be. So you see it in the top, um, and it, it it's progressively decreased. Um, so the neurons there are dying, um, and that so it should now make sense why your loved one couldn't remember what he or she ate in the morning. It's an impossibility. Yes. It depends. It depends on the age of onset, it depends. Oh, I'm sorry, um, what, what is the average age, for a ton, the average time frame? The one we typically give is eight to 20 years. Sometimes it's four, but eight to 20 years. Um, what is the typical age of time frame from healthy to severe, and it's typically eight to 20 years? That, I, I'm 
kind of apprehensive because I do want to say that the disease, this, um, the disease is manifesting way before um, just eight to 20 years. So there's a window we have decades before we see any symptoms that's actually part of the disease. The de disease has begun, but there just are no symptoms to clue us in that it has. So eight to 20 is typically what we say. Yeah, you're welcome. I apologize about not repeating the question. Yet. Yes, sir. Yes. Does a brain that suffers a toxic brain injury tend to demonstrate uh, dementia more often? So does a brain with an toxic brain injury tend to experience dementia more? I'm going to make a broad and sweeping statement and that is that any brain trauma can act as a catalyst for, for this disease. It's all, every trauma is the same. Even uh, we see a strong correlation between depression and dementia. And so any assault, we, our body only has one um, resource pool. Yes? Um, I just heard that a gentleman in his 60s had a stroke and he turned into encephalitis. Mm -hmm. yeah. Encephalitis. Can't yes yes a brain any type any type of brain infection can absolutely present as dementia. So dementia being the symptom profile, the cognitive impairment, and then the cause being encephalitis. I've heard that frontal temporal dementia results typically in rather passive behavior. Is there a particular dementia that results in Okay, so the question is, um, what is your name, sir? Dean. 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 Um, Dean said that uh, he's heard that frontotemporal dementias tend to result in more passive individuals or passive behaviors. Are there dementias that tend to produce very agitated, angry, aggressive behaviors? And the short answer is yes. Um, and, but the long answer, or the short answer too, I guess, is um, that it's idiosyncratic. So I've seen people with frontotemporal lobe dementia who are very passive. I've also seen very aggressive, um, total disregard for social moray um, in individuals with frontotemporal lobe degeneration. Um, dementia with Lewy bodies is one that has very, very high, what we term, psychiatric symptoms that can produce delusions, hallucinations, and very aggressive behavior because the person's reality has so shifted. Um, you tack on sensory impairment uh, and, and you've got a recipe for disaster and can really produce some aggression. Um, so dementia with Lewy bodies, I would say probably the most. Um, and the power, you know, this is the interesting thing. I have seen the most docile, tiny women do things I never thought would be possible, really. I mean, it's so, it's really that disease. It, it's just incredible how, what changes are, are going on. Well, I, I don't, I, I don't mean it's, you mean it with the psychiatric symptoms, you mean in the aggression. There are many ways, blood, cerebrospinal fluid, um, their imaging techniques, so SPECT is really useful for um, differentiating certain degenerative dementias. Um, but remember, we can look for those aggregates, those plaques, um, that's another way as well. We're getting more and more refined with our diagnostic abilities and less and less invasive, unfortunately. Um, yeah chain it, it, it takes so much time to make these types of tests routine and then we have to question whether um knowing that i have a causal gene for alzheimer's disease at um 29 years old no just kidding 42 years old um, is that going to benefit me um you know knowing that there is not a cure and i say a resounding yes, but it is very personal. I think many of you would attest to the fact that these are very personal diseases. They rob a person of his or her personhood and then they rob a family. Um, it's just devastating, the most devastating thing. So, <laughs> all right, I, I saw you, ma'am. You talked about that you present years or decades before. 
know that brain training app is all these things you see on the internet. So then in terms of like what you can do to kind of prevent or exercise your brain, like what are the kind of things that you can do that? Okay, so the um, the question is if we know that the disease is starting far um, before symptoms manifest, what are the things that we can potentially do? Is that a good summary of, and you mentioned brain training and then you, you laughed and it's interesting because um, I have it in our, in, in the talk a little bit later in, in your handouts. Um, cognitive training, a very specific form of computer-based cognitive training has been shown to reduce the risk of dementia by 29 to 48%. There are 18 clinical trials that back up that information. So now let me clarify, and I'm glad that you asked this question because there are many different things that you will encounter on the internet, okay? Um, so a lot of promises, and in fact, there were all of these ads that were saying, take this Alzheimer's test, and it was a terrible metric, and say, oh, you are at risk for Alzheimer's, and I bet everyone saw that, <laughs> that notice, you know, you're at risk. Okay, we, we all are to a certain extent, but it was a terrible marketing ploy. Um, and they, they uh, these companies were, were chastised, um, and, 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 and they had to remove all of their false claims, they, they got the hand slap, that has put a very unsavory um, taste in the mouths of, of um, of researchers and in the mouths of consumers of what is showing to be, and, and all in transparency, my colleagues and I, my colleague Jerry Edwards at USF, that this is her area of expertise. So she has, yeah, she um, has over 18, like I said, clinical trials, and we're working on the, um, the PACT clinical trial now that is looking at cognitive training's ability to reduce the risk of dementia specifically. Um, so what we found right now is absolutely 29 to 48%. That's huge. There is no supplement, there is nothing on the market that has shown benefit, including physical exercise. So what happens when we add cognitive training, we know it works, the specific kind of cognitive training, then add physical activity to that. Could we increase, you know, or, well, increase our health, reduce our risk? Let's, let, what about diets? A lot of um, research right now on the MIND diet. There was the Mediterranean diet. So when we say, are there things we can do? Yes, we need to focus on that preclinical period. We have to, because most of the people we see right now, they are already in the moderate stages. There's very little that can be done. Look at the brain. And at this point, we don't have a way to effectively mass produce neurons and our brain just can't keep up with the loss. There's the capability of neurogenesis or regrowing neurons as we get older, particularly in the hippocampus, um, but the brain just can't keep up with the loss. So even though there's that capability there, our brain will not be able to support it. So once there is that point, we call it the point of really no return, then um, there's very little that can be done, but that's why we do things now. You know, we encourage our loved ones to you know, make these changes now because there is um, a growing body of research that says that prevention is possible, not total prevention, because remember there are certain genes involved, but I'm saying stack the deck in your favor because the mounting body of research says that there are things that we can do. Okay, and I said your hand, sir. Yes. Is there a common finding with football players? Yes, and that's called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And yes, very strong legs, so they've really um, tightened the reins in on uh, helmet to helmet. They've made all of these. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> you're welcome. Okay, that's a lot of people. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, yes, Mr. Just curious, the past studies that you had, by some of us participating, I did. Yes, thank you for asking. Um, so last time I was here, I talked to you, I had the pleasure of talking to you about the Preventing Alzheimer's with Cognitive Training Clinical Trial. And thank you again for your invitation. Um, so I know some of you have indicated that, that you are participating or have participated, and it is still ongoing. Uh, we are looking for adults. <laughs> 65 and older who are cognitively healthy. This is an Alzheimer's prevention trial, so cognitively healthy older adults. We have um, over 800 
participants right now, which is a testament, and I want to thank you all for your support because I will tell you that in research, the two most uh, significant obstacles are finding individuals to participate and volunteer their time and funding. Um, so that thank you for that. So we're making progress. We have reapplied uh, for a $45 million grant to fund PACT, the continuation of the PACT clinical trial. Results are we were able to meet our benchmarks for enrollment, which is fabulous. Uh, so we will learn the outcome at the end of the summer. Um, and so we've been very fortunate to be able to stay within the community. We don't want to leave. One of my goals, I'm, I, my heart, this is my community too. I want to bring research opportunities here. Um, what's the best way to get access to cutting edge treatment and care? Clinical trials. Um, it takes 10 years or longer to get through the FDA. So um, finding, and, and especially focusing on the prevention and the alternative therapies that aren't, aren't big pharma, that's very near and dear to my heart too. Look at people holistically and let's see what we can do and let's educate, let's be advocates. Every one of us will be touched to statistically by the disease. Um, so what can we do? How can we unite? Um, and uh, they say make it a memory. Um, uh, Thank you so much.